Hello and Hare Krishna, everyone. You are listening to the Late Morning Program with Namras, the number one Hare Krishna podcast in the world. I'm your host, Namras, and I'm here with Rambaru Devidasi. Thank you so much for joining us, Mataji. I really appreciate uh, you coming on and talking to us. Nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Sure, sure. So, uh, so I understand you have uh, a different uh, projects you're working on as far as with uh, chaplaincy and mental health and, and things of that nature. But I'd really love to start uh, by talking about your journey in spiritual life. So tell us a little bit about uh, where you grew up and how you came in contact with uh, the Hare Krishna movement. Well, I grew up in a family of Southern Baptists. And uh, we, of course, if you know anything about Southern Baptists, they're all about preaching and missionaries and that right. sort of thing. And at a certain point, when I got to be about 10, 11, 12 years old, they had a radical shift. They had a pastor who, who broke away from the conservative uh, movement and started teaching behavioral sciences and interpersonal communication with the congregation. So I was growing up in an environment where... Um, connection and community was really, really important. And fellowship uh, was the most important thing is having good heart connecting relationships. So, um, and from that experience, I remember at eight before that, coming home from Sunday school, I don't know if that's familiar to you, but in many churches, there's such a thing for educating children called Sunday school. Right. And I remember, you know, coming home, we had been taught a song, Jesus loves, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And when I was eight, you know, after singing that for so many years, I thought, well, how do I, now, wait, I'm a bit of a critical thing. Wait a minute. Jesus lived 2000 years ago. I'm here now. I mean, really, how does he know me? What to speak of loving me? I mean, it was kind of a, I started to see through that a little bit. And, but it was a question I had trying to figure out how does that work? And um, for many years, I went on a search. I, I dabbled in um, early Christianity, the first 400 years after Jesus died, Essene Christians and you know, found out that early Christians were vegetarian and, you know, wow. they lived in little communities and they were into natural healing and all that stuff. And uh, when I was about 16, um, I had broken up with my boyfriend. And so I was having really one of those aching heart moments driving home from school. And it dawned on me that if you were to sing radio songs, these love songs on radio, uh, and you were sing them for Jesus, they would be hymns. So in, in my desperation, I was driving and singing these songs with Jesus in mind. And I had this kind of experience. I, I don't know what it was, sentimental, emotional. Um, and and it, it felt uh, like I was in the presence of Jesus. You know, it was like this weird, uh, my ears kind of got teary. You know, it was one of those uh, Lord Chaitanya ecstatic moments, which, of course, I didn't know Lord Chaitanya then. But right. I marked it as, ah, this is perhaps how uh, Jesus loves me after 2,000 years. There's a presence, and, and you connect with that presence through singing his name. Wow. And then I discovered much later on, I guess, in my dabbling around in uh, meeting the Krishna people much later, uh, it was again, ah, that was, that was uh, again, Oh, we we invoke the divine through sound vibration. So it kind of was matching up. But I was on a long search for you know figuring things out, wow. and uh, you know eventually went to um, a Quaker school in North Carolina called Guilford College, and I studied uh, religion and uh, as, as a BA. And I at a certain point, uh, you know, we had the Vietnam raging. I don't. That was a that was a very confusing time. Sure, I became sure. really repulsed by uh, American politics and realizing that uh, there was a power differential in the civil rights movement and people of color were terribly persecuted uh, right down in Greensboro where they did all the pouring sugar on their head at the Woolworths. 
And I became embarrassed, you know, as a person who grew up Baptist and then I became Quaker, but embarrassed to be identified with white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, which are wasps, you know. Kind of. right, right. And I decided I had a crisis after my sophomore year thinking, gosh, it's really great sitting in a comfortable college speculating about philosophy and when you've got people dying and being persecuted and what are you doing? Mm. And then I, I kind of went on a search. I uh, got involved in uh, Gandhi nonviolent resistance, you know, thinking about that. I took a uh, independent study with a philosophy professor on Bhagavad Gita, you know, and oh. he, he sent me down to the hippie bookstore looking for a Bhagavad Gita. And when I got down there, there were like 10 different types of Bhagavad Gitas and there was Prabhupada's Gita among them, oh. a very large, colorful one. I brought that home. And my professor was like, oh, no, you got this Bhaktivedanta Gita. It's, he's made something devotional out of something totally impersonal. So I liked it because it had the pictures. So right. I, tried, I tried very hard to figure out how to, how to practice it. I had become vegetarian by that time, gardening into sustainable living and stuff. But uh, And I'd seen the devotees, too. Uh, one time in South Carolina, I'd seen them in the underground, <clears throat> And I marked it that they were they were huddled talking to each other, obviously selling magazines. But the sound vibration of the way they were talking to each other struck me as uh, there was a Bible verse that uh, materialistic people's sound vibration is like clanging cymbals and tinkling brass. So when I heard the devotees' uh, soft way of relating and their sound yeah. vibration, I thought, oh, these are different people just by the way I could... I'm a bit of a musician myself. I play by ear, um, mm. piano and stuff. So I'm very, I'm very sensitive to sound, and that, that really piqued my interest. And then later on, there was a young boy on campus who was uh, selling books. He wasn't quite as impressive as he was impressive in a different way than the, yeah. these devotees. And he had a, you know, a Wrangler shirt on and a bed sheet that had been ripped, and his tea lock was like a big ma mass of clay, and his Sika was like that, a helicopter, and and I had just become a Quaker, so I was going to sit down and save him. You know, I felt so right. sorry for him. Boy, he looked totally brainwashed, and uh, I sat down, and I tried to, you know, in college, we were learning how important it is to look into someone's eyes when you're communicating, yeah. and the more I tried to get in his vision, the more he was looking at different parts so obviously trained as a brahmachari don't look at women and mm -hmm. so i was totally dodging that trying to get real with him yeah. i never could make a connection but he showed up in our women's ashram you know community in um uh, in on campus there was like a little women's community and he was knocking on doors to sell magazines and he shouldn't have been there but he knocked on my door and i opened it and he fell down and offered obeisances and then wanted to sell me a magazine just give give one and i was horrified it was like my it was a very two different experiences of Hare krishna people while studying the bhagavad gita and trying to figure it out and i finally realized that i needed to find some uh temple or something to figure out how to you know, navigate all of that. But wow. yeah. It's kind and then, of, when did you like join the temple and where? Well, after I had this crisis about Vietnam and, and stuff, I decided to take a hiatus from the Guilford and I applied for something called uh, a uh, ecumenical year abroad at Schiller College. And ecumenism was very popular in that day because with so many Christian denominations, people had become turned against each other, you know, had right. Catholics and Protestants and various, and I, um, I was trying to find my way back to the original Jesus, who was the spiritual teacher, mm -hmm. and uh, ecumenism kind of pulled that together. They threw out all the doctrines and just focused on uh, the love of Jesus as being their unifying principle. And so as a teenager, I'd gone to Young Life and, and different groups, and it really appealed to the heart. It was much more based on uh, personal relationships and singing and that kind of thing. So I went to Germany, to Heidelberg, and uh, by that time I was on a quest to answer a really important question that was in my mind about eternity. You know, when we think of eternity as being like in mathematics, you have the, the line that's eternal this way, going both directions, and then you have the ray that's eternal as a point going 
starting somewhere and going eternally, which is more right. of a Christian notion that, okay, you become eternal. And then you have the Eastern notion that you are eternal. I had to figure this question out. So I, when I went to school in, in Heidelberg, that was my burning question uh, for the professors. And they said, oh, that's postgraduate study. We're not going to answer that here. Of course, they didn't clearly know the answer, so they couldn't answer it. So <laughs> I had met, I had I was on this quest also to, to find Quakers in Germany, found one really old community. There was one person that was my age, uh, a lot of re really more like Amish in Germany. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I happened to bump into a devotee selling magazines on the street, and she didn't speak English for very well. And um, and I tried to, I wanted a magazine, but she kept running away from me, you know. I, the, in those days, we had a lot of different religious groups trying to proselytize. You know, you had the, uh, you had the um, uh, Moonies and you had the Born Again Christian. I mean, everybody was giving leaflets. And so they were kind of chasing you. But this particular devotee was, you had to chase her to get a magazine. And um Finally, I chased her down and she pointed me to the temple to go and I called and there was an American on the other end of the phone, which was nice when you're in Germany. Yeah. And so I went to the temple and I had written about a hundred questions I wanted to ask them just from my own curiosity. I was one of those inquisitive people and uh, the whole temple sat down in Heidelberg, which was just a little house in the foyer up on the stairs. We were sitting there and, um, the person who was the GBC at the time, Hansa Duda, he sat and answered every one of those questions to my session. Wow. I was pretty satisfied. And of course, I was uh, very attracted to the food. You know, mm -hmm. I, I've always been a foodie, perhaps even a bit of a food addict. And uh, when I tasted the food, it was just amazing, you know. And I would walk from my uh, little apartment at the college 30 minutes every day just to eat. That was my original wow. thing. So, yeah, I was there for a little bit. And then very soon, probably about two months after I joined, I wasn't even initiated. I had an arranged marriage <laughs> wow. with the temple president. And um, and then we were sent to Switzerland. We opened a center there and Munich and different places. And eventually uh, we ended up at the Schloss, if you remember the castle, um, yeah. the Schloss Regisoff. And then we were sent to Ireland via England. And uh, we're in Eng Ireland for about 12 years in, in different places, Dublin and, and Belfast and whatnot. Wow. And uh, established the temples in uh, Belfast and also that big Hare Krishna Island, which is still there. Right, right. But, yeah. And, and when, did you, uh, when did you meet Srila Prabhupada? Um, let's see. When did I meet him? The first time was in the Schloss. He was coming. And... Um, it was very early on, and uh, Hans Aduda had had uh, this. This was very controversial, but he was advertising that the Führer kommt, which is what they said about Hitler. You know, it was advertising. <laughs> you know, probably was coming in the airport, and so that stirred up a whole lot of news. And, oh gosh. Yeah, flags, and he had us in procession with flags hanging out and stuff. But I remember being, um, he came, there were all the devotees from England and Italy and Spain, and everybody kind of came wherever Prabhupada came. And they just showed up, and there you had people sleeping everywhere. And um, and uh, I just remember my first impression, uh, because of, of being a kind of a academic person, I was a little proud of myself thinking I had studied so many religious beliefs and that they're kind of all the same. And in my mind, I thought, well, if I get up close to this teacher, guru, I'll be able to really see where he's at. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, he came in on a red carpet and I was really astonished how short he was. You know, he was just, you know, has such a big personality, but so small yeah. and everybody lined up and him coming down greeting different people that he knew and uh it became apparent at a certain point that boy i have no ability to understand this person it was just embarrassing it became overwhelmingly clear that boy you have no idea who this person is and wow. so he, if you know of pictures there's there's footage of him um, coming into this assembly, but they had a big Vyasa san and um, everybody gathered around him in the VIP lounge. 
and I, I became nervous that he should should look at me. He was looking at different people he knew, and yeah. I was I was like, oh, please don't look at me. You'll see how incredibly um, contaminated an, an illusion I am. Please don't look at me. So I hid behind a couch. You know, there was a, there was like a circle of people a few feet from him. It was maybe ten feet from him, and there was a couch, and the people were standing behind the couch. So I got down behind the couch with my head sticking over thinking, well, he will not see me if I hide, but that made me more conspicuous. And so mm. he kept, he kept looking around, but then coming back thinking, what a, is this a midget? Is this a person <laughs> with a bomb? I mean, you know, would, would look if you think in terms of looking out at a crowd. Yeah. And um, so he would look at me and I was, I, I felt I actually experienced a visceral crack uh, my heart sort of just broke at that moment, and I just floodgates of tears. It's something you hear from a lot of Prabhu disciples when they saw yeah. it, it was just a cleansing. And I just sobbed. It was just like uncontrollable, and I felt really like a rain had washed my heart out at that Amazing. moment. But I realized my position at that point, that I really had no idea uh, mm. who he was or whatever. It was just really... Uh, it was profound. I mean, it was just a very profound uh, moment for me. Right. Coming from a very strong, like Baptist and then Quaker background, you, you basically got your questions answered by the devotees. And then you were like, okay, I'm ready to, I'm ready to just commit myself to this kind of very different and strange, almost strange kind of religious religion. And w was it like that? I mean, you, you kind of just left the, the previous many years of, of, of another religion. Well, I was in college, so I'd already left home, and I'd been in college for about a month when I met the right. devotees. And uh, the devotees were moving. They were in Heidelberg, and they were just getting ready in a few weeks to move to the Schloss. So I was like, oh, my God, they're going to leave, and I'll right. be still here in Heidelberg. And um, I also understood through my uh, Christian history background that, you know, in the early Christian days, they lived in community. You know, mm. Christianity has grown and people don't live in community unless you become a monk or a priest or whatever. But I recognized Hare Krishna movement as being a, an, an example of early Christianity. So I thought, you better jump in because the train's leaving. And um, <laughs> part of joining the temple at that time is you had to reduce all your belongings to the, the size of a fruit fruit box. So everybody lived out of a, like an orange box or an apple box. And oh I had come to college, I had clothes and boots and sweaters and all kinds of stuff. So the ritual was, is that, uh, you know, all the ladies, Brahmacharinis would gather around and you would dump all your things in the middle of the room. Does anybody need a sweater and stuff till I was reduced to a, a, a box of apple size of stuff. Wow. And uh, yeah, I just uh, moved with them and mm -hmm. I had had a marriage which was uh, in Heidelberg and I called my father up inviting him on Friday to my wedding on Sunday. Oh my so that's how much that's how much notice he got. Yeah. He panicked. He didn't know what was going on. If you can imagine American American parents and yeah. um, we had all kinds of uh like Ted Patrick brainwashing things going on and you had a uh, guru Maharaji and Scientology and people were scared yeah. that their, their kids were disappearing. So he got on a plane and came to my wedding, he filmed the whole thing. And um, my husband who, who he didn't, who didn't introduce himself, picked him up at the airport and he was so nervous. He got lost on the oh. way. To the temple. <laughs> And they were talking. He didn't say, I'm the one who's marrying your daughter. It was oh my goodness. It was so weird in those days. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. So it was different. It, it, what, what I was looking for was the original Christianity, not the Christianity that I've come to know of today. You know, right. I, wanted, I wanted, I saw that that was really paramount that people live in community. So, right. yeah. And then, and then, so you, you, you started all these temples and you, uh, you know, traveled and, and, and lived in Ireland for 12 years. And then you had your children around that time as well. Yeah. Madi was born in, uh, in uh, Frankfurt in, uh, when I was in the Schloss, the, the, the castle and Madhava, Nila, we call him Nila. He, he's an initiated new name is uh, Sri Madhava Mahotsva. He was born in um, Ireland. Okay. Yeah. They're nine years apart. Wow. 
Amazing. And then, and then I remember, you know, reading your bio that in 1999, you went back to school. I did. Yeah. I had, go, we moved to Vrindavan from Ireland. We moved to Vrindavan. We lived there eight years. Uh, you know, I was working the Gurukula. My son, Nilo, uh, was there. Uh, I started preaching out of there to Ukraine. I was invited to go there. But then at a certain point, when my son was about 10, there were some problems in the Gurukul. He didn't, uh, he wasn't uh, coping well with it. And so we tried to homeschool him and do different things. And in the end, it made sense to move to Mayapur, where I, I became a Mayapur Gurukul teacher, and he was there. Oh, wow. So I moved there for two years, and then I had to come back to the United States to get my visa updated. You know, every 10 years yeah. you have to do that. And uh, by that time, Madi had moved to L.A. My, my husband had been, you know, given GBC zones in uh, the United States. And I thought, why should I go back to India? And my fa half my family's here. Yeah. So, and my father said, why don't you just stay? So I, I got on the phone, and I found Irma's Gurukul. And um, she was willing to graciously uh, have uh, my younger son stay with her in her basement and educate him while I went back to school 45 minutes away to Guilford uh, oh, no. during the week. And then I'd come pick him up. So for two years, he lived with her in her ashram and I lived uh, 45 minutes away on campus or in a professor's home. And then he would come on the weekend. and. Mm. Uh, then at, at a certain point, Madi moved to L.A. and started a life for himself, went to school, probably heard all his story. But Right. Uh, so for those listening, last week we had Madi, who is uh, Mataji's son, older son. So yeah, so he, he called me up and he said, look, we've never had a fan. We've never lived together because nine years apart, different girl call, different times. And he said, "Let's. Why don't you move to LA, and we'll just create the family we never had at 18." So I applied to Claremont School of Theology, was accepted there, got a scholarship, and uh, did three years, got a Master of Divinity, then it did a year of PhD work, and then was really tired of studying. Wow. And uh, we had kind of a family crisis, so I decided to take a break and go to Yuma, Arizona, to study chaplaincy for a year. And that was when my life changed. <laughs> what made you what made you go back to school after so many years like just serving and raising the family and things? That's a good question. Well, I you know, I had uh, after 35 years, I had done every service there was to do in the movement, you know, kind of cooked and deity worship, but I'd done it all. <laughs> and, and uh, of course, living in Mayapur right before I uh, went back to school, it was very hot. If you've ever lived in Mayapur in the summertime, it's really hot. You can't do a lot, but just sit. Right. Think, and in the Brooklyn, I had opened a library. You know, for me, it was really important uh, learning and knowledge. And uh, my younger son and I were so kind of bored and tired and hot and sweaty. We sat and read the whole library out loud together in that hut. You know, we had like a mud hut in those days. Mm. And I realized how much uh, how much curiosity I had about how the rest of the world worked. You know, I kind of went from a very short period of college into the Hare Krishna movement, then got married and everything, you know, lost touch with a reality or another reality. And um, I realized that I had a lot of questions and um, it, it just wasn't enough. I didn't feel my brain was uh, exercised enough. And, uh, and I also felt like my younger son wasn't getting the education that he was going to need if he were to go back to school in America, living in the jungle of Bengal, you know, it was, right. doesn't, didn't seem to be uh, an appropriate education for what he might have the freedom to do kind of limited him. Yeah. So uh, I just, just and, uh, there was another thing I needed to figure out how I was going to support myself, you know, um, yeah after 35 years of being in the movement, it doesn't give you much of a marketable skill. You know, I thought, right. well, okay, I'm going to write a resume. Well, I know how to cook samosas and how about, <laughs> oh, well, that's not going, we won't pay for that. Yeah. Or, or yeah. Like, how to do did So I had to really think really hard and quickly, how are you going to pay your bills? And, um, and I, I started to think of the six opulences of Krishna and knowing Krishna is inside of each of us. I thought, well, what, what can I cultivate? And I, I, I landed on knowledge. I thought, well, I can, I can uh, have a strategy that I would go back to school or continue my school, 
uh, in a way to, I would get scholarship that would pay for, you know, room and board, which is what they do. I took out some loans and, and, uh, and everything I did had to have some kind of certificate that would create more of a portfolio. And mm. so I just sort of built my resume so that I had a mar market marketable skill. And in the beginning, it was a bumpy ride. It was quite, uh, yeah, it was not so easy to have mm. to, after 35 years, to learn how to communicate in a way that people could understand without the buzzwords we had developed in ISKCON, so many words like blooped and um uh, I don't know, in Maya, in a, in the <laughs> theological professors did like, what are you talking about? You know, <laughs> you know, you had to learn another language. Yeah. So it was kind of a challenge and I didn't know the computer. I didn't know how to write a check. When my younger son got to the United States, he had no idea how to put a piece of mail into a mailbox. You know, we had to learn like, um, people who come out of Jamaica or Costa Rica and they land in the United States, they don't know how to function. In right. fact, I have a memory of me and Asari, uh, very new out of India, going to my first Whole Foods. And 35 years before, the Whole Foods were hippie shops where you had barrels of things. So I could navigate those. But now Whole Foods had chutes where you had to push the thing up and then the stuff comes out. Yeah. And I remember standing there in uh, Whole Foods trying to get some peanuts out of this thing. Yeah. And I couldn't figure out which way to pull it. I pulled it up and I was so surprised and overwhelmed that a hundred pounds of peanuts came out of that chute before I could figure out how to close it. Oh and I'm standing in Whole Foods up to my ankles in peanuts, hoping that somebody didn't see that and has a broom. You know? oh my <laughs> like, goodness. That's how you know, out of touch I was. Yeah. I mean, I mean, some it's, it's interesting how, you know, devotees who have dedicated so long to the movement, then for them to go back into the world, it's, it's sometimes very difficult in, in what you're telling me just to re kind of, you know, connect and, 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 you know, come with the times and whatever's going on in the world. Yeah. And, and then, so you were saying how uh, becoming, uh, studying to become a chaplain really changed your life. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, we had to take in seminary, we had to take something called pastoral care, which is sort of a, you know, what pastors need to learn to deal with their congregation. And there were about 20 different uh, programs that showed up in our classroom to present their particular program, trying to get students to come. And there was this one uh, supervisor down in Yuma. He showed up in a pink shirt, a belt buckle, cowboy boots, and some blue jeans. And he was as comfortable with himself that I've, than I've ever seen anybody standing in front of a group of 150 people without any notes. The others had stiff ties, you know, trying mm -hmm. to impress. He was just as real as anybody. And I thought, this guy knows something that I want to know. You know, as an introvert, as public speaking has been really hard for me. And I thought, yeah, there's something about this guy. So I interviewed, you know, I, I applied down in Yuma. And uh, generally, you have to take a semester before they will accept you for residency. But he accepted me right on. And I found out the man was a horse whisperer, had worked with a famous, uh, this may not make sense, but a guy named Monty, who was very famous for being able to train horses without any ropes or any wow. whips. He just, by his presence and his... Um, a uh, soft way of handling the horses would, would uh, follow him. And now, of course, that's a, a healing modality for people in leadership, learning how to command the respect of a horse. But he, he, his philosophy of training chaplains was uh, the same philosophy he used to train horses. Uh, gently, his idea of philosophy was to gentle people through yeah. presence and kindness. And I was just totally... Uh, eager to learn from him, you know, and so I went mm. down to Uma for a year. And that's where I uh, realized after studying for six years, summer and winter, a lot of head knowledge that uh, what I had been studying up until now was not true bhakti. It was like, this is all theory. Where's the practice? And, um, you know, being in the emergency room every day and up at night with people who had lost loved ones and, and shot by gangs and had serious illnesses confronted me with the real level of human suffering that's out there that I, I never really came in contact until that moment.
was just that's, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, I feel like we as devotees don't really get in touch with, and also living in first world countries, we don't get really in touch with those. So, like if anything happens on the road, like an accident, something like immediately it's all cleaned up and we're kind of away from seeing any kind of suffering or death or things like that. And, and uh, so, so what is the reason? So d- did you want to become a pastor, pastoral or uh, do pastoral care for ISKCON or because I know you're saying you, you were saying, you know, it's for a congregation. So well, I, actually, let me back up here. The reason I went to Yuma was because I, I wanted to do a, my PhD in comparative religions and I, they had a chair at Phoenix university. And I thought if I go for to Yuma for a year, I will get residency and I could get a cheap deal at Phoenix. Oh, I see. When okay. I got in on this program, I, it, it totally bewildered and confused my direction and uh, let me just uh, say that when I was at seminary, my pastoral care professor sent us all out on a mission to have a discovery. And that was first write down the most scary population you ever can imagine talking to as a pastor or a minister of your mm-hmm. religion. And I wrote down children of uh, burned children, children who were critically burned. I don't know why I put that down on my paper. So she called the papers in and then she gave us an instruction that we all had to go to that place and sit for at least an hour in front of these people and dig up what our theology had to offer them. So that was my first exercise in confronting 50 children who were in beds and who had amputees and disfigurement from burns sitting in a balcony meditating on, oh gosh, what would I say to give these people hope? And of course, first you karma theory. Oh, you must've deserved something. You know, I'm sitting there very confused at what I'm watching. What would you say to children who are so uh, harmed and so in pain and uh, had to write a paper on it, but I never really found the right, things I wanted from our our literature that I could say. I was really stumped about it yeah. I guess, due to my own projected stuff. But when I got down to, to Yuma, it became clear to me day in and day out, talking to people, listening to people who are suffering that, uh, yeah, they don't want to hear uh, you shame them. They already feel embarrassed and ashamed. That's not what they yeah. want to hear. They need to hear that in spite of Whatever else is going on in their life, they're loved in spite of it. They're not alone, that God loves them. Whatever God you worship, he's there and uh, he's present, he's listening, and he's responding to prayer. So that was a huge awakening in my spiritual life to to think. And I I felt so bad that I, I didn't get this after 35 years, that how could you have been practicing spiritual life and not have really understood what compassion really means. Yeah, you know, I, I cried an entire year, which wow. just really something for me as a life changer. And then I decided not to go into my PhD work. I decided, you know, I couldn't bear another moment of dry uh, study and theory and sitting behind a computer. And I applied to the Virginia Commonwealth University to uh, train as an educator, which is the PhD of pastoral care. They don't have, chaplaincy doesn't have a proper, because that's meant for research, a PhD. So I relocated and I spent uh, three years there at Virginia Commonwealth University as a faculty and and trained uh, to do that work in a hospital, you know. Yeah, that's really interesting about sometimes <clears throat> I, I think we can have all this philosophical knowledge and backing in our Krishna consciousness movement. But then when it comes to like relating to other people's suffering, sometimes we, there's a disconnect there. Uh, and and what you're doing, I mean, let's talk a little bit about uh, Karuna Care. Now, how did that start and what is that exactly? Well, um, Karuna obviously means means compassion. And um, when my father got sick uh, in 2017, it it became apparent that I needed to move to Virginia from L.A. I was the director of the Los Angeles uh, St. Camilla Spiritual Care Center Urban Interfaith Chaplains. They had a program in in downtown L.A. Mm -hmm. And so I had to take a leave of absence and it became it went on and on, you know, until he died. And um, 
um, I tried to do part-time different places. And uh, at a certain point, devotees were asking me, why are you not teaching the devotees these, this skill of pastoral care? You're busy teaching imams and priests and pastors and rabbis. Mm -hmm. but it's, I, I mean, I was working with every religion but my own. And wow. uh, truth be told, I wasn't sure because all of my students had to have already had a Master of Divinity degree and, you know, they had a training track. I wasn't sure devotees would be able or willing to do the discipline of it. I mean, it's, you know, it's yoga. It's it's very, very challenging to, to do a clinical pastoral education program. It's 400 hours. Uh, 100 hours of class time and 300 hours of bed to bed to bed to bed to bed, talking, listening to suffering, grieving people, and then coming back and doing homework. And so I wasn't sure I would have the uh, the ability to, to really train it. And I really wasn't sure, in fact, doubted seriously whether ISKCON would welcome it. You know, when I would tell devotees what I did, it's like, why would you want to do that? Really? Why? Why? Get entangled in all of that. Just chant Hare Krishna and be happy. I mean, seriously. <laughs> uh, people don't uh, don't understand the benefits right. and what it is. And they just want yeah. why. So at a certain point, I uh well in while I was still in LA, I had gotten uh I had gotten so uh ill, I hurt my back. My granddaughter pulled me in the ocean and I really twisted my back. So I was on my back for about two months and in a wheelchair in LA. And it was so painful. I had to crawl to the bathroom. I couldn't sleep even with medication. It was just so horrible. Mm. And uh, in, in chaplaincy in the hospital, we're aware that when people come in the hospital, it's generally not what it, it's not the reason they come. They're having a spiritual crisis. It's a spiritual crisis that leads to the material calamity. You know, it's a small voice you haven't listened to and it gets so big now you're stuck on your back. So I applied that to me and I thought, okay, what are you ignoring? And uh, I had to do days and days of introspection to find out what is Prabhupada trying to get me to hear that needed me to get on my back awake and in pain to be able to pay attention to. And out of the right. deep, the, the, when I say this, I always uh, laugh at myself because it sounds so uh, woo woo, but it, it kind of came up that you need to do three things. You need to radically change your direction. You know, I, I was a director doing one of those 60 to 80 hour work weeks, <clears throat> bringing work home and all the time ruminating about all these suffering people. And it just came out of the deep place that you needed to uh, start teaching Bhagavad Gita. You need to start singing with your harp and you need to start writing. So I immediately signed up for Gita classes at the temple and I started to do kirtan with my harp. And then the writing piece I was not sure of. I haven't done a lot of writing except for academic writing. And um, so when I was over here in Virginia, I started to think about that because devotees were saying, you need to you need to step up. You've got something uh, to offer. You need to you need to offer it back to Prabhupada. And so I I really took that to heart that. Yeah, I spend all that time and money and energy. If it's not used for Prabhupada's mission, then it's kind of a waste of energy, you know, if I hadn't done mm -hmm. that. I had also had a dream when I was in Vrindavan, uh, living in uh, the ashram, Prabhupada Vani ashram that my husband had developed. And it was just a very short dream of me taking prashadam, a plate of food to Prabhupada, bowing down. And as when I come back up, Prabhupada says to me, can you ask your husband if you can take care of my personal body? And then he 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 um, waves to these Gordy Thai deities that are on a cabinet there on a, a dresser. And he says, you know, without the mercy of Lord Nichinanda, you can't get the mercy or shelter of Lord Chaitanya. And then I woke up. So it was like, oh, God, what did that mean? You know, uh, wow. dreams, probably, dreams can just be fabricated by the person. So I didn't take it all that seriously. But yeah. I did. I did look, do a search. Who is Nichinanda? What is that? How? So, and I, I came up with two things uh, in that Prabhupada talked uh, in an example of how two sons were fighting over his father's body as, you know, when my disciples fight, they're tearing my body, you know, how the two sons are fighting and they, they yeah. end up uh, beating up the husband, uh, the father yeah. and uh, Nichinanda being the support of the householders, you know, the kind of Lord Chaitanya had sent him to be, to be uh, kind of the guru of the, the householders, the people who are not the traveling preachers, but the people who are 
you know, having families and in their homes. And um, so putting those two things to I put those two things together, I thought, oh, well, you know, maybe, maybe Prabhupada wants me to um, somehow figure out how can I bring what I'd learned into ISKCON. I'm getting older. It's not going to be a few more years when I won't be able to speak probably my hands will be shaking and so it's either now or never if you're going to do something and yeah. i started consulting with various gurus and vice Sika said if you want to write you've got to start teaching because otherwise um you can't organize your ideas so i started karuna care on john uh 2019 and i just started hammering out some kind of rudimentary plan and we started in april 2020 and I've had I put two cohorts as an experiment through uh, a kind of a lay chaplain training program. I didn't want to call it pastoral care or right. anything that reminded us of Christianity. And um, and uh, I realized at the end of 2020 that perhaps it was too deep for a lot of people, you know, because in order to do this work, it requires an enormous amount of introspection and honest searching and i didn't find devotees ready to do that work you know a lot of doubt you know about why should we care about all those things and um and then in 2021 i started to go wide and broad rather than deep and so that's what i'm doing right now with my courses is uh you know just seeing who will come into that net and who's really ready to to do that uh, inner work that you need to do if you're going to be a listener of all kinds of stuff people right i i have a few friends in the area who are chaplains mm -hmm. and i know they do it for like hospitals and and things mm -hmm. like that what's the need in our society for for pastoral care or chaplains uh and how does that work exactly well pastoral care is uh it's just a listening skill being a compassionate listening presence which is sounds really simple but it's not so easy and um, hospital is just one place. People are in crisis, uh, hospices, prisons, you know, old yeah. people. So it's wherever people are suffering, pastoral care is, is a really important skill for everybody to know, whether you do it professionally or not. It's right. really about learning how to be empathetic or empathic without judging and advising or prescribing. And I don't know if you've noticed that, but generally when you start to talk to people, they immediately are going to be telling you, how you should run your life rather than helping you tease out what you need to do to solve your own problem. Right. It's so seductive that we have, we just, it's a knee jerk, you know, and as a, pro a preaching movement, boy, when somebody uh, is a captive audience, we really take it to town. You know, we really come out with the Bhagavatam verses and all these things. And I have seen so many abuses of this, uh, in ISKCON that I felt like, gosh, we really need help here. Because if you ever talk to someone who's lost a child to death or who's struggling with cancer, that's the last thing they want to hear is somebody yeah. self-righteously telling you what you should be doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's a real, it's a real need. And, and, you know, we are conditioned souls. We're mixed devotees. A lot of times people think, well, I'm initiated. I'm done. I'm there. I'm, I'm uh, self-realized. It's it's a long journey, and if you think in terms of having the the offensive stage of chanting, the clearing stage, and the perfection stage, Prabhupada says it takes 40, 50 years to chant without offense. That means that as mixed devotees, we have a lot of the same struggles that everybody else has. We have one foot right in the material world, and uh, we're working on those things. So uh, at least the people I'm listening to, they have big problems. Bigger than I, I perhaps want to even publicly admit to. Uh, right. It's shocking and horrifying. And um, what I'm learning as I work with devotees, and it's not just uh, rampant in our Hare Krishna movement, it's rampant in Buddhism, you know, movements who Westerners join a Buddhist movement, you know, people who often are uh, traumatized and they are uh, coping with their. Uh, childhood trauma or their family trauma through what's called dissociation. And they think it's detachment. You know, we have this, we admire people who are detached. Detachment is not the same as dissociation. And uh, essentially what it boils down to is people are pretending to be more than who they are 
rather than just being an honest mensch who has strengths and limitations. Yeah. Um, you were because of the social pressure to be, you know, perfect and pure. And, uh, you know, we've made these vows and eventually the whole structure collapses. And then you have depression, you know, repressed emotions turns into depression, suicidal ideations, addictions, you know, and then you have other, otherwise you have explosions, you know, expressed inappropriately and hurt feelings and not knowing how to say things like, I'm sorry. And uh, we, we, yeah, it, it, this is just rampant, you know, that yeah. we have a philosophy that somehow encourages people to dissociate and we, it, it, it's kind of a match. You come looking, you're wounded and you find a philosophy that supports your removal of yourself as a human being, you know, and you think you're being spiritually advance by doing that <laughs> can you can you tell me again the difference between detachment and disassociation well a dissociated person is generally really um it's like you have this shadow side you're very averse to uh anything that doesn't fit into your paradigm because it rocks you you're really uncomfortable and so right. you may now become hate, hateful or hostile to people who are different from you um you know, and your your philosophy becomes more and more rigid, more and more rigid because you're trying to protect this vision. Right. Whereas a detached person is so comfortable in themselves, they're not at all threatened by people who are different. You know, right. yeah, that's real detachment is that they're not they're not uh, angry and hostile and and judgmental of other people because they know everybody has their own journey with Krishna. I don't know what that is, and I'm. I'm not going to speculate about what's going on in their life. I'm happy to listen to them and hear from them how they understand their life, but it's not me to try and interpret and judge and impose upon them my idea of what what works for me or where I am in my journey. Does right. that does that make sense at all? Yeah, that makes sense. So you're saying that like you could like maybe immature devotees they they are disassoci is it disassociating? They're that it, that's what they are basically uh, that's their ideology? Well, it, yeah, it comes out in different ways. You know, you have what we call Sahajism, which right. is pretending to be more than what you are. I know we have a philosophy that couches it very cleanly, but what in practical theology, which is what chaplaincy is, what what is it, Sahajism? Is you're pretending to be more than what you are. And impersonalism, mm -hmm. the other part of it, is you have this notion that everybody should be like me, the same. So even yeah. though we, we have a philosophy that looks, again, clean, but it, what it boils down to is our behavior and how we view the world and our perspective. And so traumatized people who haven't really worked through their trauma, they have inner wounds, and it, they come and dissociate, which means it's hidden. You hide all that, you repress all, and you're projecting it on a, on a whole lot of other people. Mm. And, and now it's okay to criticize, but you're really looking at the things that you hate in yourself in other people. Right. And people don't know that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's that's totally I feel like what I mean, right now how divided we are even as a society when it when it comes to when it came to politics or when it comes to covid or the vaccine or what, you know, and and I see so much of that uh I don't even know how to explain it, but it, but but I, I liked what you said about, you know, it's it's things that we don't like about ourselves that we hide about ourselves. And then we project that on others that, oh, you shouldn't be doing this or you shouldn't be doing that. And then when we're not able to make the mark, then we feel, like you said, depression and addiction and things like that come out. That's exactly right. Yeah. The guilty dog barks loudest. <laughs> the guilty dog barks loudest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how do we how do we get over that as a society when there's such a spectrum of practitioners? You know, we although we all you know, there's there's people who are initiated and committed to the thing, but sometimes you can't make the mark. And then, as a pastoral, as a as a chaplain, how would you talk to someone who comes to you and says, "Hey, I you know, I'm I'm feeling these things." And I, I don't feel I can make the mark or I feel like I'm judgmental to others. What would you say to that? Well, I moved to education, which is why I started an education program. I've started a couple of initiatives to address the isolation. And generally, these kind of imbalances in mental illness are really caused by isolation and loneliness. Mm. You know, you find yourself surrounded by this huge community 
and you have nobody you can really talk to about your real life because everybody's got a persona that they're presenting in order yeah. to feel accepted. And we want so badly to be accepted and to belong that we're willing to do anything to have that happen. And so I've started these uh, resilience groups where devotees come. There's absolutely no agenda. And um, people come and uh, share their challenges. And there's absolutely no, uh, the rule is no judging, no advising. Everybody gets a chance to share. And as a group, we process it together. We offer support. And uh, I can't tell you how many people have said this is just such a breath of fresh air. It's actually part of our philosophy. It's sarusanga, these loving yeah. exchanges, which yeah. used to be couched as istagostis. We don't do those anymore. Right. But if you look it up, if you look it up, it's defined as uh, friendly talks among devotees. That's what istagosti means about Krishna. And so instead of talking philosophy, although we do some of that, it's really about how do we practice it. It's about embodying unconditional love rather than talking so much about it. Mm. You know, and that's what I realized uh, in my training is that we do a lot of talking about bhakti. Christians do a lot of talking about agape love, which is the same as bhakti. And Buddhists talk about loving kind, unconditional loving kindness. But, uh, you know, that doesn't touch hearts. It's when you behave that way. That's what you, you, okay, embody, show me. When I go into a patient's room, I'm not there to tell them my philosophy or my theology. I'm there to embody it by being an unconditionally caring listener that offers support. And that's a, that's a skill and very hard to learn once you have learned this conditioning of, I've got to teach you, I've got to preach to you, I've got to change you. That's not what really changes human hearts. Yeah, you have to embody it. I love that. You have to embody it. And, and uh, there's a funny song, don't talk of love, show me, you know? Right. <laughs> and people don't care, what what is it? People don't, uh, and uh, what is it? Don't care about what you know until you uh, show them how much you care. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. it, when it comes to being a good listener and uh, being non judgmental, sometimes people wouldn't like, people just don't open up to anyone. Like, I wouldn't just go and say to anyone my issues or problems or things like that. How does one make, how do you embody or how do you make yourself a person that someone would like to? Uh, speak to in that way you can because it's not just anybody that can do that right well you have to um, you have to first of all pay attention and reach out you know you uh, my my interest when I go into community is to notice who are on the margins every community has an inner circle and they have people who are on the mar margins whose voice is heard whose voice is not heard and to pay attention to those people and to uh, reach out to them with care and make sure you have time. Uh, like, you know, come, let's hang out for a little bit and tell me your story. You start yeah. there. Tell me about you. And most people are like, well, I don't have anything to tell. People aren't used to telling the story. They might be suspicious, but you, yeah. you know, it's about, it's about uh, trust is about consistency, you know, and being consistently interested and uh, maybe sharing some things about you that will help them open up. But in, in, if you're going room to room with people, you may only see them 10, 15 minutes and never see them again. So it's really about, you know, introducing who you are and that uh, I am here to uh, listen and what's on your heart today. Mm. Just, and that's how we start our resilience group. What's on your heart today? Share what's on your heart. What's alive? What's your challenge? And uh, once you push that button and you actually demonstrate that you're going to sit there a minute because people don't don't want to dump on you. You know, they're so used to not wanting to tell you because they don't want to dump on you. But if you if you say, yeah, I, I want to hear your story, um, you, you now don't know how to get them to stop talking. So, <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And you were saying how all of us can become like chaplains in in a way that all of us can learn how to listen and, and yeah. give that kind of compassion. I mean, when when you in Karuna Care, the the initiative that you started, so you're giving people actual training on how to do that. Yeah, and and at different, there are different levels. Right now, it's mainly information. You have to take three in introductory courses, and if if you're still standing after the three, 
<laughs> then we may consider doing a more deeper initiative, you know, which I, you know, will be like two, three months uh, programs where you will have to do a practicum in order to learn this. You have to talk to people. And my students last year, they all had to talk to four pe four hours of listening and COVID happened. So we weren't able to physically go to places and they use Skype and WhatsApp and, and they learn, but it's nothing compared to my chap, my professional chaplains who do 300 hours of that in three months. And they did about, gosh, maybe 40 hours in three months, but still they were able to learn. Then they bring in rotation case studies back. They bring conversations that didn't go well. They don't know why it didn't go well. And oh. so as a group, we put it up on the screen and we go through it, we role play it. And, um, and then we all give our, uh, the knowledge that we're learning about behavioral science, what was going on there, like the age of a person in crisis that makes a difference uh, to how you might respond and uh, what are you noticing? How might you have moved past that moment? And where did you get hooked in that conversation? Because so often, if you are talking to someone who has an issue that you haven't resolved, now you start to make their issue about you. And it's almost irresistible to, to, to not want to tell them or preach over them or talk over them because you're, you've got so triggered yourself. So we work as a group uh, on helping each other uh, learn together how to do this work. And uh, the more cases you hear and the more practice you have, the more good at you, the more better or the better you get at it because each person's individual and unique and you just can't predict who you're going to talk to in the next minute. When it comes to being a chaplain, I, I would feel like if I'm talking to all these people telling me their issues and problems, like I myself would feel like really bad and, 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 and really like I'm taking on someone else's suffering for me personally, that's how I would feel. How do you deal with people <laughs> like your whole, your whole uh, career and, and, and thing right now is about teaching people how to do that and also doing that yourself. So how do you not take on or become kind of tainted or, or, you know, bogged down by, by other people suffering, but at the same time being compassionate to them and really giving them your true self. Yeah. You need to have good boundaries and really good self care. You know, you have five areas that you need to nourish in yourself, your body, your emotions, your intellect, your spiritual life and your social connections. And you need to have clear boundaries to know what your limits are. You know, how much time can you spend and uh, you have to also be very tuned into. Now I'm saturated. I can't talk to another person. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And know what to do then. And uh, debriefing. That's the other piece, which is why we have the outgrowth of the Karuna Care Education is the Karuna Care Association. So those students who have finished the, the uh, program, the six month program, they become, if they choose to be featured on my website as a need help responder they have to have continuing education. So we meet once a month and we continue to learn, even though you may have graduated, it's a constant communication and debriefing of hard cases and uh, shared resources in order to keep going. Just like professionals have to constantly keep learning and sharpening their skill. Yeah. And, so. and is there, um, is there like a kind of certif uh, certificate you get at the end or anything like that? Yeah, we if you we have a, obviously for the for the four week courses I'm doing you get a little certificate and that that can be saved as part of a portfolio uh, that we're working on trying to get equivalency in the National um, Professional Chaplains Association so that we can create an MDiv master degree for ISCON devotees who want to do this professionally. We're working, I'm working with someone named Dina Bandu up in New Jersey and some other chaplains. Oh yeah, Dina Bandu is a good friend of mine, yeah. Yeah, okay, so we're working on what's called a white paper and um, we're working with the uh, associate professional associations and they are happy to work with us because you know we're latecomers. You have Buddhist already since years, they've got a track of equivalency because like us, they do a mentorship, they don't go to seminaries, but they, they have said we can compile portfolios. So if you do Bhakti Shastri, Iskand Communications, certain courses will count in clock hours. Oh, wow. And uh, there's some, some things that we don't provide that we need that they say we can go to a, a, 
a community college and get like bioethics and comparative religions. But I have just been communicating with uh, Shauna Carisi, who's an old devotee from Ireland. Right. And, um, and he would like to work with us. They have been working on uh, a spiritual care. They've written this book, but they don't have the practical piece. They have all the theory, but they don't have anybody who's uh, trained to train. You know, how do you train yeah. people to do it? So he wants to do a um, memorandum of understanding and that maybe we can create in the Oxford Hindu Studies program some kind of uh, courses that will match up with the professional association that they would accept. So we're, we're working on that now. Um, they have That's a fantastic to see. There's a lot of interest. We have a lot of devotees who are seeing this as something they'd like to do. And I'm running them through these major introductory courses just to see if they really are. People have a romantic idea yeah. about like Florence Nightingale and compassion. It is not easy to listen to people with things going on. It yeah. is not easy, and um, even with my professional students, they need to they need to get it. That a lot of people go, mm, that's not for me. This is not my work. And some people are like, this is totally my work. Yeah, I was just um, at a funeral uh, for one devotee here that that um, left her body, and I was meet. I was seeing the family, and I was just thinking to myself. If I was if I was with them just alone, I wouldn't know what to say. Mm -hmm. Like I wouldn't like I would you know my condolences and and what you normally say to someone like that. But as far as like hearing their and I don't have any training in what I would say to someone. So I think like it's really important that all all ISKCON devotees learn just the basics on how to listen and how to be compassionate and how to be empathetic. What would you say are like some real basic things that you could communicate to all our listeners, about 80 people listening, about how to be good listeners and how to be good, empathetic and compassionate? Just in a oh, nutshell, in a oh, sutra. Being maybe. a good listener means being a good listener. Just stop talking. <laughs> just <listen. laughs> I mean, you got two ears and one mouth. I mean, that that yeah. already, if you just, and, and to, to join the person where they are, which is, it takes a bit of, uh, tuning in to really read body language and, and uh, pick up on where they are and invite story, invite them to share their story. You know, what what was it like? Or uh, when you're around the bed of somebody who's just died and the family's all piled in and they're shocked or yeah. some are on the floor crying and they don't yeah. know what to do. Well, you know, you're, you're inserting yourself in that family very quietly, letting them know you're here. And then you're, you're silent for a while watching the dynamics and then maybe inviting them to share a bit about that person. You know, tell me about Aunt Mabel or whatever. Tell me about her and what was what was meaningful. What do you what did you love? What do you miss? And um, you know, often then it turns into conversation and laughing. You know, yeah, I remember when she used to cook that thing and do that thing, and and it brings people together in a way that's that's different than they're all standing there uh, isolated and not knowing what to do. Yeah. I often bring my harp and play music for them. You know, I play a little harp and sometimes it's just enough to hear music and um, sing a song that they love. Like Amazing Grace is a really popular. Yeah. And uh, often I will gather them around and say a prayer with them and let them also do things. But it takes some training. And now in Christianity and in, in Judaism and other religions, it's a requirement for their Brahmin and their priest initiation to have really? had one semester yeah wow yeah because Fantastic. after after going to three years of seminary you have then you you're faced with the congregation you have no idea what to do with them yeah so i think it should be a required thing if you're going to get brahman initiation you need to have some training okay so now you know how to do rituals that's great you know you can go on the altar that's great you know Bhagavad gita that's great what else do you know <laughs> you know and that's practical. practically and Christianity has divided. They they have four as four uh, jobs of a pastor, and one is is there a prophet? Like we sit on the Vyasasan, we talk a philosophy that's speaking truth. They have the priest who does the ritual. We have that. They have the king who's the manager who manages the temple, and then they have the sage. And the sage is the chaplain, like Narada Muni. He shows up when someone's in crisis, and he tries mm -hmm. to give hope, and he's he enters into their scenario, and he gives hope. That's what we're trying to do. 
mm-hmm. is accompany people in a crisis. It's not it's not psychotherapy. We don't diagnose. We don't try to prescribe anything, but we may see someone you know six times and then assess. Looks like your grief is quite complicated. Maybe you should see this person. You know, on our website we have several resources, and we may do like I do several grief support groups. I have a divorce grief support group for ISKCON devotees, believe it or not. And I have a suicide grief uh, group that I do with uh, one of our ISKCON communities who had a suicide in their their community. And so as a, as a community, they're working through it in a process. And wow. um, I'm hoping in June just to have a generalized grief support group for people who have lost to death a loved one. Uh, I haven't put it, put it on the website yet, but I, that's my hope. I feel like all temple managers should have this training. So then there's like one person in the community who like knows it really well and they can even teach it to others in the community, other leaders. And then they can have like a group in each community that will be able to like to be able to counsel people and to hear them and become a chaplain essentially for that specific temple. Is there any plans for that, do you think? in ISKCON to like well, kind of make that more widespread that's part of the vision. And I have, I have a student, I have people who have finished alumni in Sydney and Melbourne in Merwollen bar. I have someone from Chicago, from Gita Nagari, from oh, nice. Vrindavan. I have different people who have gone through the program who we meet all the time. We're all the time in communication. And when hard cases and situations come up, we talk, you know, what, what's the best way through, um, we go into also uh, restorative justice as conflict resolution mediators, you know, learning that skill, how to do resilience groups. Um, not doing things in isolation is the key, is that you really need to have know how to create community among people. And even if it's just you and the person who's suffering, create some connection with them. But that, that would be a vision. And just recently... I'll just share this because it's. I, I have my first meeting tomorrow with the global um, devotee care team. Uh, I think he's run by Goranga, Radhanath Swami disciple, who okay. uh, I think he's managing the Go- Govardhan Eco Village. So that's new for me. I've been invited to be part of that. Oh, no. And uh, they've asked me to feature. They're going to do something like 12 uh, features of different devotee care actions throughout the world and share it so people can get ideas on how they can add some of these things into their um, communities, you know, and my, my vision is to have listening centers. We have enough preaching centers. And um, I had a dream that I would have a piece of property, you know, up in New Vrindavan and and we would have little cabins and stuff, but it it just got to be too complicated. So my vision now is just have a tent, have a kiosk at at a festival and you have a big sign that says Karuna Care Listening Center. And underneath you have a sign that says, What's on your heart today? And then people can drop in and, mm. and you'd be amazed at how many pilgrims who come to to and not just New Vrindavan, but other centers looking for answers to life issues. And uh, okay, yeah. so they get to take darshan and prashadam, but there's nobody to talk to. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, that's a that's a huge thing. I mean, yeah, I know in Iskon in North America, we have so many temples, we have beautiful deities, we have wonderful prashadam, and we have the cement and mortar and all that stuff. But for p- when people want to come and talk to someone, that's sometimes hard. I mean, when you call it Iskon Temple, it's it, the phone just keeps ringing. <laughs> You're not going to really, p- no one's really picking up. Um, but that's that's fantastic. I, I really think that's an important initiative because people are just suffering like anything. And sometimes we really can get disconnected from other people's suffering. And, and also when you're preaching to people, it's like more than, hearing more than just telling them about the philosophy it's like you hear them where where are they where are they exactly and then where you have to meet them there uh you have to meet them and then they can kind of relate to okay this person kind of knows what i'm going through and and uh can and then and then when you hear what they are going through then you can kind of i know you're not you're, i know you're not advocating that okay we're just kind of uh insert the philosophy immediately but after you gain trust and things like then that, then I feel like that, that could happen. Um, that's, that's really nice. If for, for all our listeners, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the comment section. I know there's a, there's discussion happening there and appreciation and things, but if you have any specific questions, we'll take them in a bit. Um, but before that, 
I wanted to ask you um, about in the past one year with COVID and everything, how has, has your, how has it changed when, uh, what people talk about? I mean, is it, is it a lot of, uh, is it a lot of grief and a lot of, uh, you know, uncertainty about what's happening in the world? How are you dealing with when you talk to people like that? I try to get them connected because again, loneliness and isolation is the most horrible suffering when you're already suffering. You know, there's there's something really right. healing about sharing your suffering with another person. Um, that's the worst thing is doing it by yourself. You have your mind, you're laying awake at night, you don't know who you can trust. So I create these oasis. Uh, one of my students in Australia has one called the Oasis of Loving Kindness. She's an alumna. And she has a residence group, and uh, some of my other students are starting to do that. But I have one on Sundays from 11 to 12.30. It's a drop-in. I'm there. If one person comes, if 20 people come, I'm just sitting there for 90 minutes. And um, I'm creating a, a, a platform where people can share their hearts. And so I, we kind of have a little format. It's confidential. And then one on Tuesday mornings, and that pulls in Mayapur and people in Europe because you have these time zones. And then in my courses, uh, we have something called Karuna Buddies. You can sign up if you want to have, you know, because we're learning this skill. We're not just um, teaching them something. This course coming up is Name Your Feelings, Tame Your Mind, and we will be exploring feelings, which we're not very aware of, and how to use them. Yeah. And then you can sign up. Uh, you can find people who are interested to be a conversation partner and are all over the world. And you call them up and some of them form little pockets of three or four and they may work on a book together or something. But now you have friends and they may not be in your temple and maybe all the better they're not in your temple because, you know, they don't know you or live with you. But but you can just be uh, who you are there on the screen. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's another platform. And then we have on our website a button that's about to change because we're reconstructing our website called need help and it has a whole bunch of uh, resources you can sign up to connect with one of our Karuna care companions we have russian we have spanish we have a little bit of portuguese and a little bit of hindi and um and then it comes into our referral system and then one of us who has time they respond to that person you, you know if they have a language or something and then once you, you're connected with that person, you, you listen to them a few times, you kind of make an assessment and you may have to refer them to something else. Like, okay, I'm, it's a marriage thing. That's not, I'm not a marriage specialist, but I can point you to this devotee who is. And uh, you get them hooked up to resources. We have an international suicide hotline, you know, in every, not only every continent, but countries and India and, and Australia and Austria, and everywhere people are like 24 seven, they're maybe going to kill themselves. Well, you can at least get help. It's not an ISKCON devotee, but at least you can get immediate help. Yeah. And we're working on uh, my third course in July. Uh, end of July will be on trauma, addiction, and complicated grief because uh, I've, I'm discovering how many devotees have unprocessed trauma and addiction, even though they're chanting Hare Krishna. It's embarrassing to say that and heart heartbreaking. Yeah. But I think un unless we address that piece, they're not going to be able to make progress in spiritual life. You have to address it. Trauma, so, trauma meaning like, for example, like previous to becoming devotees or even? Uh, it, trauma from perhaps older devotees who were traumatized by some of the uh, religious abuse they experienced through oh, the mis misuse of power in our movement or, yeah. uh, or childhood trauma. You know, we have sex abuse. One in three women have been sexually abused. Uh, you know, beaten up. I mean, you've got all kinds of the people who grew up in the movement abused in uh, gurukuls, whatever. And so they want to be devotees. Their hearts, their hearts are there, but yeah. you've got this lack of trust, and you've got this trigger that goes off that makes it impossible to trust and uh, even to chant. So we've got to address those things first. Yeah, you know, sure. As the movement grows, you've got to have those resources. So we're. We're just working on a team of clinical psychotherapists and things who have skills and are adding some of the cutting edge um, uh, modalities like uh, somatic experiencing, EMDR, and brain spotting, which is probably the quickest way and most effective way to, to unlock some of these triggers that are embedded in our brain 
and that keep us from uh, being able to be a responsive, open human being. I yeah, I'd like. I mean, I'd like someone to tell me what I'm missing, like when when it when it comes to being a responsive human being, good listener. Like, is there anything? Is there like a consultation I can have with someone who is like, how can you become a better listener and a better person in that sphere? Because I feel like I have a kind of grip on my other parts of my life, but in this part, I don't feel like I'm so empathetic or so or such a good listener and i feel that maybe that could uh push people away from me even because i don't know myself that i'm like that but someone else who is like who's like you who 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 has studied it and who knows it and can tell me okay well you need to work on this or you need to work on that part to become a a better listener yeah, well, it takes training, and the, the the training that I offer, even to my professionals, is the process of self discovery. And right. so, you know, we put you through different experiences, conversations, education, you know, didactics, reading, and that kind of thing, so you have some understanding of the behaviors you're noticing in yourself. Yes. And, and basically, the training is is how to read the living human document. The founder of clinical pastoral education, that was his term for learning how to read people, their their voice tone, their facial expression, their body language. The words they use tell everything about you. Wow. You know, how you navigate anxiety, you know, when someone's anxious and what are you doing with that? You can tell a whole lot about a person. Are you fighting immediately? Are you running away? Are you withdrawing? Are you freezing? I mean, all of those things to a to a educated eye going, well, uh, it doesn't take me very long. I can read an application from uh, someone applying to my professional program, and you tells everything about them. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, now I've only asked you for for four or five pages. You've sent me twenty pages talking about yourself. That tells me a whole lot. <laughs> There's no feeling words in those twenty pages. You're just reporting your life. You're not telling me how you've experienced it. How it has it changed? So many things. <laughs> I mean, it's it's easier for women to 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 kind of uh, be more open like that. I feel men are much more closed. Do you feel like that? Do you, are there and what's the spread like when in your applicants? Is it like more women, more men? It's more for my Karuna care. It's a, a majority women. I we need more men. I have right. I have two men who have gone through the program and they're overworked. <laughs> Because yeah. men want to talk to men, you know, a lot of them. Right, right. But we need desperately more men. But in the chaplain field, you have, you have also a lot of men doing this work now, and sure. and very good at it. When I started doing this work, I was really disappointed. I thought there were men did not have the ability to be empathic and sensitive. From my experience, experience of ISKCON men, I didn't have. I thought, oh, well, men are just that. You know, I had not I stereotyped. Yeah. And I was delighted when I uh, became introduced to men who really knew how to communicate and they were feeling, they had hearts and they were compassionate uh-huh. and they had the language. It was so wonderful um, because we have this conditioning that men should, men's strength is not having feeling, but it's the other way around. Krishna was so attractive because he was so personal and sensitive to everybody's needs at the same time, you know, um, and that's what, and to my view, that's what strength is, is to be transparent and open. And I was giving a talk yesterday and I was asked a similar question from Thoughtful Thursdays. And, um, you know, how, how do you how do you just be your, yourself? Well, part of it is kicking the false ego out and, and being able to say in between every round of Japa, I'm an idiot. I'm just an idiot, you know, and and get over yourself because, you know, you make mistakes. Life is full of mistakes and okay, I'm learning from it. And if people point out your mistakes, you, you, why be angry about it? Well, it took you a long time to find out, you know, I'm an idiot. So it's our misunderstanding or our false identification with ourselves is being so inflated. Our egos are so inflated. Yeah. (laughs) Who we think we are. Uh, Yeah. Wow. Let's look at the questions in the uh, comment section here. A lot of questions uh, and appreciation. Um, let's see here. Okay. 
I'm sorry, I'm just reading through them really quickly. Uh, okay, here. I feel that I've gone through things both before joining ISKCON and since which have caused some damage and because of which I would benefit from the sanghas which are being described. Where would I go to connect? Are there online groups I could join? Yeah, I, I have one every Sunday from 11 to 12. You can go to our website to register because I want to know, we want to know like who you are and your, your contact information in case I get sick and I can't host it. I can send a blast out. And sometimes we have an announcements and continuing conversations. So go to the resources button. Uh, my admin is working on that. So it may be under another button, but there is under the resources, uh, resilience groups. And there's one on Tuesday morning from 7 to 8.30. And um, so sometimes there's a lot of people. Sometimes there's less people, depending on what's going on. And if there's less people, we have more intimate conversations. Right. Uh, Damianti uh, Fornes wrote, find all the resources from Karuna Care Education here at this link. So go check that out uh, if you'd like to um, join. Um we're also teaching in South America in Spanish. We have uh, the courses oh, wow. I'm teaching. If you push the button on lang other languages, it'll turn the whole website into Spanish. Oh, wonderful. Okay, here's another question. I have found that the difficulties I've been through make it easier to understand and empathize with things that others are going through and therefore offer some support. What would be your thoughts on this? Do you feel that we can turn our negative experiences into strengths for helping others? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, that's where we start to, to to create heart connection. First, we have to, uh, you know, be aware of all our own personal wounds and and pain that we've experienced. We, you know, that's part of training is being able to actually feel what we felt when we had a similar experience. So we might not have exactly the same experience that the person who's sharing their story has. But through our imagine, uh, imagination and going to that place of remembering when I was betrayed or remembering when I felt abandoned and remembering, you know, when someone, uh, I don't know, lied to me or whatever, uh, going from here and then moving out into that relationship in front of you. So first you have to go, you know, when you're hearing a person, you have to connect with what's coming up in your heart as you're listening to them talk. And from there, you can identify, this is where emotional awareness is so important. What are, what are the feelings coming up as I'm hearing them? Gosh, I'm feeling really angry to hear that someone abused you that way. And you can bring that in the conversation. You know, I noticed myself feeling really, really frustrated to hear your story. Tell me more about that. Are you feeling as frustrated as I'm feeling hearing it? Or I'm feeling really sad, a lot of grief coming up. You might even feel tearful hearing some of the stories that we hear. Mm. Um, yeah. So yeah, you really do have to, you have to first connect with your pain to be able to, to connect with what's coming up. Now the tricky piece is, and the, the struggle is how do I then disconnect from that conversation without taking that pain home with me? <laughs> you know? Yes. Yes. And that's a professional hazard because you can get really traumatized by hearing some of the stories that we have to hear. But uh, many of us have created rituals and, and the philosophy assures us that we are not the essential person here. Krishna is there. He's in everyone's heart. He has maybe momentarily put you in front of that person for five minutes, an hour. And uh, hopefully you're a catalyst for something that they're working on in their life. But it's not depending on you. If it weren't you, someone else would come. So you may only have an hour or five minutes with a person. But when you walk away, you entrust them back to Krishna, knowing Krishna, got, Krishna has it. He's got it. It's not depending on me. Right. And in the team, you have to trust every team member has the same capacity to bring help and support. It doesn't depend on me. So when we leave the hospital, we may have a ritual to, just to say, okay, Krishna, now it's yours. You've got it back. Wonderful. No. Wow. Uh, what is the relationship between compassionate listening and the physical healing professions, such as primary care? Well, so much of uh, physical ailments are, are due to stress and anxiety. 
And so one of the functions we would uh, uh, provide in a hospital is to bringing the anxiety down because everybody knows in the, in the healing, like the allopathic, at least healing profession is as long as a person is anxious, their defenses are up, uh, up and their cells are closed. So no matter what treatment you're throwing on them in terms of drugs or medication, the cells don't receive them because they're, they're so stressed. So if we can bring the stress down, then the, the treatment will go far deeper and uh, more effectively. Because the mind and body, they really are connected. Mm. They go together, yeah. Of the six loving exchanges, we are good at distributing books and collecting donations and giving and receiving prasad. But we have a lot of work to do with revealing our minds and inquiring confidentially. How can we improve in this regard? I, uh, my vision is that every temple should have a, a container. You know, you need a container. Obviously, you can't. And this is where it, 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 it's, it, it's a little challenging because sometimes someone has a problem. They don't know where to go. They might be standing in, in a prashadam line and they want to now download their whole problem. It's just not the place. <laughs> People can hear it. There's no confidentiality. Yeah. It's just uh, not the right place. So you, we have to, I believe, society has to create containers that are safe, that are facilitated by a person who has some skill. Um, and, like containers, what do you mean? Well, a play. Like I have these resilience groups. That's what my advocate, you maybe call them something else. I call them that. Okay. Uh, they're not your conventional resilience groups. So there needs to be a safe space where there are rules, there are ground rules, you know, that we don't, we don't come here to advise you. We don't come here to judge you. Everybody, nothing comes out of this room, you know, it's, it's a confident yeah space and uh, we haven't been very good at it as this kind of devotees holding confidentiality so people are not trusting but over time as you get in one of those groups you start to to you you start to feel the support and love that's developed after gosh we've been doing this about eight months now and some uh, come and go and some are consistently there and they develop this amazing camaraderie and trust that they're only on the screen they don't know each other they're from other countries but we have to we have to build those relationships and have a place and a time to do it, not just everywhere spilling out. You know, just place and a time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, recently, you posted a short video talking about how spiritual maturity means becoming human. Could you explain a little bit of of what this means? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, in the eleventh canto, I, I can't tell you where I was trying to find it this morning because it, it's a really great uh, support for uh, what's the difference between a human and an animal. Proper talks a lot about that, and uh, but really, being human is being is knowing uh, that I have strengths and limitations, you know, and and, and I'm not God. I'm not trying to be God. God's being God. I don't need to be God. I don't need to be perfect, but I just need to be human. And human means that I'm not better than anybody and I'm not worse than anybody either. And so often in Kali Yuga, even in our movement, people have so much shame because they don't live up to this ideology or their value system or, or whatever they have in their mind as Krishna conscious or perfection. And there's such a deep, sense of self-loathing and shame that they can't even talk about it. Um, and to be able to impress upon people that, yeah, I'm not, I'm not perfect. I'm also not the worst person either. You know, mm. everybody has strengths and limitations. And so to be equal, truly equal to everyone is, uh, and see oneself as equal to all human beings, not better, not worse is what's uh, what it means to become spiritually mature. Don't wow. be surprised if people, if people don't love you all the time. <laughs> you know, you're not loving all the time. Why should you expect everybody else to be loving all the time? <laughs> that's really, that's really wonderful. I really am. Um, one of the takeaways from what you were saying in the beginning of our talk about embodying instead of, you know, uh, just telling people about the philosophy, like try to embody it. That's really, um, I, I really love that. Thank you. Do you have a group that, can uh, he hear ex gurukulis as you have for divorced devotees? I don't yet, but maybe we should talk. <laughs> maybe yeah. that would be something to to have. I, I know our 
teenagers really need something like that. And um, Ritatva Jaswami has uh, often, he has come to my courses and, and been at my talks and has attended. And I, I think that would be wonderful to have something for ex coolies as well as teenagers. Uh, yeah. We have to figure out a time. That's, that's the challenge. Yeah. Uh, Aviana says, I'm interested in learning about self-discovery to help myself and others. Me too. I'm, I'm very fascinated by this topic, just talking to you about it, that I'd really, I think I need to, I think maybe this is Krishna's way of telling me that I need to focus on this a little bit, try to, try to become more compassionate, a good, better listener and, and, and that. Um, so I'm with you on that. Here's a question. Hare Krishna Mataji, when someone comes to you and opens up, do you diagnose them and tell them what they're going through? and what they should do to come out of certain trauma. Listening is good, but sometimes we do need guidance to make certain decisions. Well, again, I'm not a therapist or a psychotherapist and, and chaplains by trade. We are, are helping, helping you solve your own problems. So we may have resources and that's what we can offer. You know, we know enough about behavioral sciences and mental health and stuff to be able to identify what you have something like complicated grief or trauma or these kinds of things. And uh, we may have conversation for to maybe six times uh, and then need to refer you to somebody who is, is right. going to work with you more deeply on some of those things. Mm. But, but I could see how just becoming the listen, the listener can be incredibly healing for someone who's going through some kind of trauma even though you know it's not like a counseling or even problem solving or things i mean even like when they tell us about like your hustle life as a man as a husband like you should try to listen to your wife and not just try to solve her problems like because men's men's things are like okay we just try to solve problems and that will be the end of it but for women they just want to hear they just want someone to hear them that's what they told me so that's what uh, <laughs> uh well, it's, it's not therapy but it is therapeutic to be listened to yes yeah for sure when it comes to self-discovery and personal development as a listener can you quantify how much occurs during the conversation and experiences versus how much happens later on through re reflection oh i can't quantify that you would have to ask every single person um i think it's both <laughs> Yeah, I, I I can't put a number on it. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Here's something. Iskand devotees often become worse individuals than before joining. They feel they have to force their ideas on others in the name of preaching. Non devotees are often more civilized. What to do? <laughs> Interesting question. Well, this is where education, and that's, again, my approach is education. People don't know what they don't know, and when they know better, they do better. Because yeah. people don't know. We talk about bhakti and unconditional love, and what that means to us, particularly new people, is that I, my compassion is I'm going to give you a book, and I'm going to quote your scripture, and then I'm going to go away because I don't want to get entangled in a conversation with hearing about your stuff. That's yeah. and So people avoid people because... In, in the interest of not getting entangled in gossip and, uh, you know, falling down into all kinds of ridiculous conversations that are not helpful, we don't know how to make a healthy conversation. We don't know what to do. So we just avoid yeah. people. And that's isolated. <laughs> yeah. Dear Mataji, I've heard about your struggles very early decades ago when I was in high school. Your one point of the importance of women, devote, women devotees getting a degree stuck to me. I'm glad I stuck to that advice. My question. What inspired you to go on and have faith in Krishna, even through those terrible struggle, struggles? Well, I, I took responsibility for my own spiritual life. You know, I read Prabhupada's books very deeply. I continue to read them very deeply. And, uh, you know, chanting the holy name is, is key and uh, yeah. trying to do something that will edify human society. But I think that uh, sometimes we are under the impression as women that, that, um, we just have to worship our husband and they're responsible for our spiritual life and we get 50% and then we do nothing. We're kind of brain dead on the ride. And that that's not really true. You really do have responsibility for your own spiritual life, just like uh, Prabhupada explains birds in formation, you know? 
everybody has to fly their own plane and uh, you may have a good husband or not a good husband, but it's between you and Krishna in the ultimate in issue. You are alone in death with Krishna and whatever preparation you've made is up to you. So I think, and I, and I know this is probably a controversial and okay. Um, but I find that if women are a little more educated, even in our literature, they make better mothers. At least they can have they have a better conversation partner, you know, with their kids. They have more to share, more right. insight. Although I will I will just share a, a little funny little memory I had while I was preparing for today about Madi when he was little in Ireland and there were no kids, so it was just me and him traipsing around in Cork and our self-sufficient farm. And in those days, you know, we just thought you just preach to those kids and make sure they get all the philosophy. And I did a lot of singing with him. But at a certain point, he said to me, Mata, stop preaching. Just play with me. That's all I want you to do. Just stop preaching. Right. You know? right. I go, oh, yeah. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so Mati and both my sons have been great teachers for me. They've just been amazing. Wonderful. Guys. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. We have a type. Uh, we have the types of safe spaces in our centers, which you are describing, then should the devotees who offer the counseling be outside of the management structure so it's easier to listen without judgment? That's my opinion. I think that if you're going to do, if you're going to be a, a person who's safe, you don't want to be part of a management structure. Right. Because then it, then it alienates the management from coming with their problems as well. Cause it's not fun being a manager. It's not easy. And you need to have to play. You need a place to go and debrief as well. Right. Well, I I do believe that a person who does this work has to not be involved. Can't take sides. Yes. Yeah. How about when people do come to one for advice? How does one strike the balance between offering the advice one is requested and also listening compassionately enough to hear the real problem, the problem behind the problem, as it were? Good question. Well, it's it's really about uh, exploring with that person uh, what resources they have to solve their own problem. You know, typically when we think we have the solution, it's what we would be doing if we were them. Well, you, there's no way that you can be in their seat situation because you have a different relationship with Krishna and a different karma. So you might share what you, speaking in first person, well, this is what I've done in the past that helped me. That's not to say that this would help you, or this may be, this is what uh, strikes me as I hear you speaking, some ideas in places I might point you. But I think for us to come across to anyone who's vulnerable and in need, as if we know what's going to solve their problem is arrogant, and it's not true. They have to be the expert of their own problem solving and take responsibility to do that wow. and you can empower them. You can empower them to do that by helping them get in touch with the Lord in their own heart who knows everything. I don't wow. know everything, but Krishna knows everything. Wow. That's incredible. I mean, it takes a certain, it takes a certain real humility and empathy and also just like real, just being real, you know, to say what you said. I mean, that's, I think it takes devotees. I mean, it, it's taken me a really long, I don't think I even know it yet, but it's taken me a long time to just understand that like little bit of what you're saying, because it's, we, we are not taught that really. It's kind of more that, okay, we have the issue, we have the problem, we have the solution and here, just take it, take the solution, you know? Okay. Um, what transformation have you seen from your experience from listening? It's a very broad question. Um. It has, it has helped me uh, become more humble about myself and to make room for Krishna to work in people's lives and to realize that I'm just an instrument. You know, I, I'm not important. Krishna is going to work through whoever that person needs. And if, if the more empty I can be of my, uh, my presumptions and my speculations and my judgment, the more useful I can be to other people. Yeah. So that's been transformative because as I was uh, laughing about my son at two telling me, you know, a long way and it's taken a lot of 
heartbreak, you know, really to to have my heart break open to realize, you know, I'm not important. I'm only on this earth very short. I have a few years left. And uh, if we can if we can learn to just be there as an instrument and uh, accompany people in this journey back to Godhead, that will be big for everybody. <laughs> you know, wow. it's a journey. I'm a medical student. How to concentrate in my reading? Please help, Mataji. <laughs> what? What? What are you reading? What are you reading? <laughs> I guess she's. I guess they're asking about Krishna conscious literature. Like to concentrate on on reading. I think that's what they're asking. Well, I, I can only tell you what I I do yeah, myself. Please. I don't know how to help you. Please, you, yeah. you know best. Uh, I find that you know after breakfast, my brain doesn't focus on much. So I go to bed very early at night, and I get up very early also. And that's a practice I did throughout uh, my studies and having a child and navigating deity worship and babies and all of that, uh, sometimes even going to bed at 6 p.m., 7 p.m., and getting up as early as midnight or 1 o'clock to read an hour, to chant, wow. all my laundry before Mangalarti. You know, the pressure was so great. But I do find... It, it it I concentrate better if I read an hour before I chant and and uh, it just goes in so much better when I'm early early in the morning, before sunrise and uh, it's Prophet's program but it it does later on in the day the mind is already in the mode of passion going here and there yeah yeah so that's for a question for myself do you, do you feel like if you w didn't have the sadhana background. It would be it would be difficult to deal with what you deal with on a on a daily yeah, basis. Absolutely, and that's a requirement for all my students, professional and otherwise. So they have to yeah. have a strong spiritual practice. Yeah, right. How can we open up to someone when we have lost trust when we shared with others and it was not kept confidential? Good question, and I think a lot of people go through this. Well, you may not want to open up to that person. You know, and I think that once bitten, twice shy. And I think yeah. that for people have to earn your trust. You know, it's not that everybody's trustworthy. And um, I've been asked this question many times because people have been hurt. They've opened themselves and then, you know, been betrayed that you test someone out. And we call that poking the possum. You know, you have a some roadkill. You don't yeah. know uh, your animals on the road. You don't know if it's dead. So you take a stick and you poke it. And if it moves, you know they're not dead. Yeah. So you you poke the possum with a person. Just you try them out with a little little piece of information. If you notice them responding with judging and advising, you know they're not the person for me. And you have to, you may have to try out different people to see who has really got a compassionate heart. And they're not many, which is why I'm training. And we have to have some kind of spaces where people have rules of engagement. This is what we, this is an oasis. We don't do that here. Mm. And something to, to, how do you say, navigate those so you don't have one person dominating uh, a, a session, you know? But yeah, if they've hurt you already, I wouldn't be sharing again. Not right now, <laughs> but then, but then y you could, then you could kind of be scarred for life in a, in a way. If it was really bad, if it was like something that you know a really big breach of trust, and how would someone get over that? To share well, even anything with anyone else. Well, to find people who really are trustworthy is very healing. Yeah, my personal uh, opinion is is that. We need to learn how to speak our truth in a way that communicates care. And when we have experienced a hurt or a betrayal in relationship, we need to immediately address it, not wait three years to stew about it, but be yeah. able to say, you know, that really hurt. Did you know, mm. were you trying to hurt me there? I, I Maybe I misunderstood what you're trying to do, but I've experienced that as being really hurtful. Or, or you go... The professionals say, ouch, oops, you know, you know, they say these things as a funny way to express to the person who has maybe uh, undermined or shamed you or guilt tripped you or something to let them to say something to let them know without retaliation. And that really requires only saying something simple that I need you to know how much that hurt me to hear you say that. Mm. That's not blaming them. It just, uh, you know, it happened what it happened. It's my karma, whatever. But you, I need you to know that that was really painful to hear you say that. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I, I never saw myself that way or whatever it is you said. Just always take responsibility for your feelings without making someone else responsible for them. Wow. I was very close to taking initiation, but one main authority of the temple I go to caused me to feel so discouraged that I don't longer want to take initiation if that means not uh, to be able to be the individual that I am. And I, I need to filter the good things that were helping in my enthusiasm in Krishna consciousness. Uh, what advice can you give me? I'm hurting so much. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. Um, well, you know, you say ca- cause this person caused you to feel. That's an illusion to think someone can make you feel something. My my I- exploration with myself would be, what was it that authority did that triggered something perhaps maybe someone in your past or or you have had experiences before where someone treated you that way that was discouraging. That's not to say that you should, you know, continue on listening to someone who you don't feel inspired by. Certainly we need to find mentors and teachers that inspire and encourage our spiritual growth. So maybe that person isn't for you, you know, and just acknowledge it, but there are other people and even Prabhupada, says to us uh, that if you cannot find a spiritual master, you know, you're looking at the vista of various uh, initiating gurus and you don't find one who fits your description or uh, relieves your anxiety or, or solves your doubts, just read Bhagavad Gita and do what it says. Because a true spiritual master is simply repeating the words of Krishna to Arjuna. So he, he does say that. I cannot tell you where. I, I think I read it in the Bhagavad Gita myself, but that is is what I would be doing until I had uh, I had the readiness or I found somebody who I really had trust in. And certainly you need to keep your eyes open and uh, test out if somebody's bona fide. And certainly you need to be a bona fide disciple too. But you can start already by just reading Bhagavad Gita and learning what Prabhupada says, because he's our founder and everybody's pointing everybody back to Prabhupada. So you might as well go right to Prabhupada and learn from him until that right person comes up. That's what I would be doing. Right. We are never taught how to listen in school. We are taught how to read and write, but never to listen. How to be less judgmental and just to listen. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, judgment is a kind of a word we're all allergic to. And and actually having good judgment is a, is good discernment. That's not a, yeah. that's not a bad word. But being judgmental means that you have all kinds of uh, projected stuff that you're putting on others, things you don't like about yourself that you're putting on others. So how to how to move from judgment? The trick is is instead of being judgmental, to be curious. You know, to even in yourself, if you're critical of yourself, sometimes you're really harsh on ourselves. Yeah. To be able to step back and go, hmm, gosh, Ron Baru, you're really being hard on yourself. What's that about? Be curious. And same thing when you notice yourself really in your mind, dishing it out in your mind, (laughs) maybe you have hostility for someone that not everybody, but this particular person, I would then use that as a archeological dig into myself. What is coming up? Where are they coming from? It's not about that person as much as it's something that's being activated in myself. So be curious, just be curious about it. And um, instead of judging it, just be curious and go on that archaeological dig to figure out what it is. Wow. Wonderful. Yeah. Great answer. Uh, do you have any connection to Germany? I'd like to learn more about Corona care. Is there Corona care? I mean, it's all remote. I don't have a student in Germany, but I do have, I do have people who come to my res- resilience group and courses as far as Russia, India. I have someone, a couple of people from uh, Czechoslovakia and from, so yeah, there's no reason why you can't, enroll in a course we have one coming up next friday so you have to hurry if you're going to get into that one um but yeah you can you can join from anywhere you have a zoom and a time zone go to this link here um karunacare.iscon.org you can check out the website there is a form there where you can um you know uh, uh, message the the team there and uh, get connected wherever you are in the world we also have a Patreon page. I forgot to say that. It's oh, Patreon, sure. patreon.com slash Karuna Care Association. And we post uh, all kinds of uh, videos that are by people who are relevant topics. And uh, 
yeah, you, you, you can get more information there if you just want to learn on your own some things. Just like oh, wonderful. Things, yeah. That's great. Um, so that, that's that's the, all the time we have and all the questions we have. But uh, uh, Ramburu Mataji, thank you so much for joining. That was really educational for me personally. And also, mm -hmm. our, I'm sure our listeners got a lot out of it. I really felt your, you know, your your wisdom and uh, your, your your listening side. And I mean, even though, uh, you know, I just I just felt a lot of um, your experiences from from this conversation, and I think you have so much to offer uh, the ISKCON Society and so much to share and teach from all your experiences as well as your academic, uh, you know, experiences and your education on, on on this subject. So I I really encourage everyone to go check out Karuna Care's website. Join if you can. See if, you know just if you're curious about it. And, and and message her uh and i i, I just want to know if you have any parting words or any um you know closing statement for for all our listeners i think if there's one thing i want to impress upon people is that whoever you're talking to devotee non-devotee everybody carries a story and often that story is filled with pain and grief and trauma and uh we had the suicide talk last week uh, out of Alachua and just being kind, being interested, and even just smiling at a person can often uh, change their course, which could save their life. I just want to leave that with you just to consider that everybody has their own drama of life and it, it's yeah. usually uh, not easy and just being sensitive to the challenges everybody's carrying. Right. Yeah, and and I know you're on social media. You're on Insta, uh, you're on uh, Facebook as well. So if you'd like, if anyone would like to get in contact with Mataji, Mataji there, she's also on Facebook, uh, and also through the website, you also can get in touch with her. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you everyone for listening. That is uh, the late morning program. That's episode fifty six. I'm trying to do hundred episodes this year, so mm -hmm. I'm doing one every week. Next week, I believe I have uh, Swami Tripurari coming on to talk to us, which is also going to be very fascinating and interesting to hear his uh, his side of the story, you could say. But um, thank you all for listening. Please share this conversation. Please like the page. Please follow the page on Facebook and on YouTube. I'm also on Instagram as Namras. Uh, and uh, thank you all for listening. And uh, Mataji, please stay on uh, after I play this outro. Hare Krishna, everyone. Thank you for joining. I curse my heart, I curse